and here. Okay, the announcements I think you've all heard before, but just in case you haven't, about two weeks from tomorrow on the Birmingham West Campus will be the first of our college transfer fair days in 2020. We'll be going from 9.30 till 11.30 to Birmingham West Campus, uh, the academic building, that's B Hall, and uh, there'll be tables all up and down the hall uh, accommodating these various schools. And, and huh? Yeah, got it. Courtney, uh, right? Okay. Is anyone else coming in? I didn't catch your name. Okay. So that will be Wednesday, February 12th. The next day, Thursday the 13th, will be on this campus. They'll be on this campus, and that's from 930 to 1130. They say it, it's going to be in this building. They say in the campus cafeteria, I think what they mean is the faculty staff dining room. Because the cafeteria is not that big a space, and they're going to have the end of breakfast and first of lunch during this time. That would be really crowded to have all these uh, colleges and universities there. The list of those invited is impressive. I mean, a huge list. Uh, and if you want to see the list, you're certainly welcome to look at it. And uh, if one of the schools you're interested in, or more than one school you're interested in, is there, please uh, go by. And even if you're not sure where you're going to go, go by and interact, find out what types of things they're looking for, what kind of questions to ask. Uh, it's a good experience. Now, if any of you are going into a pretty active STEM program, that's science, technology, engineering, or math, specifically the engineering part, this is a great summer research opportunity for you, okay? Uh, it's uh, power optimization of electrothermal systems. Now, you may not know beans about that, it's okay. You'll learn about it. You'll learn big time about it. They're looking to recruit minority engineering students to work at three uh, institutions this summer, University of Illinois, University of Arkansas, and Howard University. It's a 10-week internship uh, program that exposes undergraduate students to academic research in the fields of mechanical, electrical, and material engineering. Now, fantastic learning opportunity. So how much is it going to cost? They're going to pay you $5,000 for that fantastic learning experience. What a deal. That's $500 a week just to go there, okay? In addition, you receive free housing, which I think usually includes a meal card. So free food for 10 weeks, okay? They will pay you airfare to get up there once and to get home once, okay? Anytime you do other than that, that's up on you, okay? Um, and then the, the learning experience is just priceless, okay? It's all over the place. The deadline for this is February 15th. Um, I've got two page and a half, uh, basically, of information here, a little brochure that I kind of squeezed together off my printer, not in the greatest of shape, most of the information on the inside of it. Welcome to take a look, and certainly welcome to apply. So give it a shot. See what it's like just to do it. Now, Stanford University is also listed, but they're not hosting, or either they're, they're already filled up with their students, or they're not hosting any. I don't know, but the other three institutions are. All right. Anyone else come in since I called roll? You didn't hear your name called? Okay. Then uh, let's get going where we left off. Last. Well, first, any questions from anything we've covered so far? All right, and I have a few questions for you. We finished 1.4 but didn't get to the vocabulary. So let's just uh, note these questions. If you have your text, they're at the top of page 44, section 1.4. Uh, chapter 1, Functions in the Graphs, 1.4. It's functions. So functions, functions, functions. All right. Number one, a relation that assigns to each element x from a set of inputs or 
What does that set of inputs call? Domain. Excellent. Exactly one element Y in the set of outputs. What's that called? Second. Range. Okay. Is a blank. Function. Exactly. Okay. Number two. For an equation that represents Y as a function of X, the set of all values taken on by the blank variable X. What do we call the blank variable? The what? Okay. Um, it, it may be in a way that, but they have a special name for the input variable. Independent, exactly. The independent variable x in the domain and the set of all values taken on by the what variable y in the range. Dependent. Very good. Number three. If the domain of a function f is not given, then the set of values in the of the independent variable for which the expression is defined is the blank blank. If they don't give you what the uh, domain is, what is, how do you Determine it. Those values for which the independent value is defined. What is that called? Not given explicitly, it is. <coughs> Anybody? Okay. If you flip back one page. If you got your book up on page 43, that summary, summarize at the bottom of the, uh, in fact, it's, it's in the summary of function terminology. The last thing listed there, or the second thing listed in the summarize, uh, what is that called? The blank blank. Implied domain. If it doesn't explicitly list what values are in the domain, then you determine the applied domain by the nature of the function itself. Okay? We did several with that. Remember, you avoid, what, three th two things do you avoid in the domain? What values do you have to exclude? These are the variables, x. Say again? And yet, second, Marina. Marina. Okay, got it. Okay, Trinity. What? Okay. What two features specifically do we look for in the implied domain? Values that have to exclude and can't use. Say again? Okay. So big negative. This is a dividing line. What goes underneath the dividing line? Say again? Denominator. What about the denominator? It cannot be zero. Okay? So if you have a variable in the denominator, in any expression whatsoever, whatever value it could take on that make that denominator zero, exclude out of the implied domain. What's the other place you look for variables that you have to exclude? Under square roots, okay? What has to be true about whatever is in the inside a square root sign? Inside the rarity. Say again? It cannot be negative, okay? It can be zero, but it can't be negative. And name, please. Second. What you say? Okay. So Trista. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Anyone else come in that you I didn't acknowledge your name? Okay. Now that was number three. We're doing the uh, vocabulary top of page forty-four. Uh, last thing we're doing in chapter 
adjustment, not in chapter one. Chapter one functions of the graph, but in section 1.4 of chapter one functions number four in the vocabulary. One of the basic definitions in calculus uses the ratio f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, as long as h is not equal to zero. That ratio is a blank blank. The numerator has a minus sign in it, so it's a difference. And since you have divided by, that's a, what's the answer when you divide? Quotient, difference quotient. That is one of the key elements, and that's one of the last things we did in this section. So again, let me go over the homework exercises here. You've probably already done them all, but just in case you miss some of them, uh, either five or seven, they're both account chat, seven's account view, nine's account chat, any of the odds 11 through 17, they're all account chat, 11's account view, any of the odds 19 to 29, they're all account chat, 21's account view, 31 or 33, both account chat, any of the odds 35 to 41, they're all account chat, 37's account view, either 43 or 45, both account chat, 47 or, let's see, any of the odds 47 to 55, all at count chat, 49's at count view. And then any of the odds, fifty-seven through goodness gracious, they go on and on and on. Okay, fifty-seven to seventy-one, okay? Any of those should all be at count chat. And then any of the odds 73 to 79, they should all be at count chat. 75 is at count view. 81 or 83, they're both at count chat. You can explore doing um, 85 or 87, they're true false. 89 is an error analysis. I really don't like this because they're printing something in the book that's wrong, but they put a big red X so you know it's wrong. Uh, so if you can think, you know, work through that, that's fine. Uh, 91, you can think about doing, and also 93. Any questions then? 1.4. A little long section, but it introduces just about everything you need to know about functions. Okay? Now we're going to be a little more specific. So this should go hopefully a little faster. Still in chapter one, functions in the graphs, 1.5 is analyzing graphs of functions. Now let me tell you this, if you haven't picked up on it yet, this author of this book loves graphs, okay? It's gotten to be a pretty big thing, I think, in most calculus book, uh, pre-calculus books. They really like to visualize with graphs. So we'll be doing that in this section. Now, here are the objectives, and I said it should go faster. There's quite a few objectives here. We'll use the vertical line test as a test for functions. We will find the zeros of functions. We'll determine intervals on which functions are either increasing or decreasing. We'll determine relative maximum or relative minimum for, uh, values of functions will determine the average rate of change of a function. Okay? Now, we've already done this, but by a different name. When we get to it, you'll realize we have already done it. And we'll identify even and odd functions. Those odd ones are really strange. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so let's start with the graphs of a function. We've studied functions from an algebraic point of view. Okay, we did things with it, set them equal to each other, found zeros. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Gotta make sure y'all are awake. All right, okay. Okay. Now, uh, in this section, you'll study functions from a graphical perspective. And if you remember in the very beginning, we said there's several ways to express a function. You can write out what a function is in, in a sentence form. You can put it in 
tabular form or ordered pair forms or something like that. What's your name, please? Thanks, Lynn. Second. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. Jemaya, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, good deal. Anybody else come in and sit there when I walk away? Okay. Uh, you could write out a, a, sentence, a function in a sentence form. You can express it as tabular form, like a T table or a horizontal table. You can write it as a set of ordered pairs. That's sort of the same type thing. Uh, or you can write it as a equation or a formula. That's sort of the al algebraic point of view. Or you can express it as a graph. That's what we're focusing on here. The graph of a function f is a collection of the ordered pairs x, f of x, you know. So what does f of x mean? Say again. One thing I told you is going to be really important in this course. What is f of x? What we normally call is x. What do we normally call our ordered pairs? x. Y. F of X is Y. Y is equal to F of X. Most important thing for you to remember in the course. Y is equal to F of X. Okay? So we'll be doing the collection. Uh, the graph of function is a collection of ordered pairs X, F of X, or X, Y, such that X is in the domain of F. Now, certainly some functions, you can't find them all because there's an infinite number of them. Okay? But you can get representative ones and then kind of connect the dots, okay? As you study in this section, remember that, oh, here it is again, x is the directed distance from the y-axis, positive to the right, negative to the left. That's what x measures, how far you are from the y-axis, okay? y, which is also f of x, is the directed distance from the x-axis. Positive up, negative would be down. This function doesn't seem to go negative anywhere. Okay? So here's the graph of the function. It's a set of all possible y values or f of x values for any given x, at least between here and there. Okay? It seems like it goes on forever because they don't put a dot here indicating it terminates. So it looks like it just keeps going here. This keeps going there. Maybe some place down here it will go negative. You can't tell. All we see is this. So there's your x, there's your y, which is also f of x. Does that make sense? All right. So here's example one. Use the graph of this function, f, shown in this figure, 134, to find first what is the domain of this function, f. What is the domain of L? What does domain mean? Say again. The input, exactly. And what variable represents the input? What's your name, please? Simmons. Alexis, right? Okay. All right. All right. So which variable represents the input? Okay, what are the potential, possible, in fact, are the x values represented by this function? From negative 1, and that includes negative 1 here, to, to 5, does it include 5? No, because there's an open circle there. So this would be the, the domain of this function, L, would be in an interval notation expressed like this. Let me get my pen set up. Okay. It would be from negative 1, including negative 1, that's why the bracket, all the way over to 5, but not including 5 because it's an open circle. That's one way to represent the domain of the function. You could also say the set of all x's such that x is in this as negative ones less than or equal. Yeah, let me write it this way. The set of all 
x's because that's the input value such that negative 1 is less than or equal to x but x is less than but not equal to 5. So these two things say the same thing. The equality here makes this a square bracket. The failure of an equality here makes that an open square. Okay, does that make sense? Now, the B part. The function values f of negative 1. How do you get that? What does negative 1 represent there? The function. Okay, yeah, that is part of the domain. You find negative 1 on the which axis? The x-axis. There it is. Now you find the function. There it is. What's the value there? 1. Okay, so f of negative 1 is equal to 1. How about 2? Say again? Yes, you go on the x-axis to find the 2. Because what goes in there? f of x. So the 2, if x is equal to 2, find 2 on the x-axis, here's the x-axis, then find the function is down here at negative 3. So f of 2 is negative 3. Now, next question, what's the range of f? From where? Okay. Usually we say the lower first from negative 3 to 3. Perfect. Okay? It goes the y value negative 3 up to the y value of 3. What about brackets, parentheses, equal signs, and that kind of stuff? Both closed. You're absolutely right. So the range of f can be expressed two ways, from negative 3 to 3, brackets on both sides, close brackets because they do include those values, or the set of all, what variable I put there? Say again? Why? Perfect. Why not? Okay. Why? Such that, how would you express that? Negative 3. Help me. What symbol? Huh? Less than or equal to Y and Y is Less than or equal to 3. If it pen would write, there it goes. There's the other way to express it. This right here, since you have equalities in both of these, you have brackets on both ends. The lowest value to the highest value. Why is something in between those, including the endpoints? Does that make sense? That's how we express domains and ranges. Domains are the x, or the input values. Ranges are the y's. See, just looking at this and that, you can't tell which is which, except reading the question. Okay? This notation, though it's a little bit longer, that tells you this is the domain, the input value, that's the output value. Very good. Let's see how they did. Okay? The closed dot at negative 1, 1 indicates that x equal negative 1 is in the domain of f, whereas the open dot at 5, 2 indicates x equal 5 is not in the domain, but it goes right up to 5, but doesn't include 5. Okay? 4.9999999999 would be in that domain, but 5 is not. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. The B part. Oh, so the domain of f is that all x is in the interval from negative 1 to 5. Bracket here because it includes negative 1, open parentheses here because it does not include 5. But everything up until 5. Okay. The B part. 
because negative 1, 1 is on that uh, graph. It follows the f of negative 1 on the x-axis is 1 on the y, okay, or the f of x. Similarly, over here, 2, you go down and find 3, 2 on the x, negative 3 on the y. That's a point on the graph follows the f of 2 is equal to negative 3. Remember, what's in parentheses is the x or input values. What f of that is is the output or the y. f of x is y. So f of negative 1 is 1. f of 2 is negative 3. f of x is y. Does that make sense? All right, good deal. And C, because the graph does not extend below negative 3, but does include it, and does it go above positive 3, but does include it, then the range is the interval from negative 3 to 3. Okay? Looking at this without reading this, you don't know if that talked about a domain or a range. So if you wrote it the other way, it's a set of all y's, such that y, uh, negative 3 is less than or equal to y, less than or equal to the top of your bracket, less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to Two ways to express it. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Now, as you've already noted very well, that the use of dots, open or close, at the extreme left and right points on a graph indicates the graph does not extend past those points. Because you have a dot here and nothing follows a dot, that means this is the left end point, okay? This is the right end point because nothing follows it. The closed dot means it does include negative 1 here, but it does not include positive 5 there. Everything up to that positive 5, but not 5. Okay, if such dots are not on the graph, then you assume that the graph extends forever, okay? No dot there, or the graph keeps going here with no dot at the end, keeps going here with no dot at the end. You assume it just keeps on trucking. Negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, that would be the domain one. Unless, of course, you had some open dots in that graph, then you'd have to exclude those values. All right. Now, by the definition of a function, tell me what the definition of function is. What does it tell you? In relation between the two, what's the caveat that makes it a function? Any given x, only one y, okay? Only one y. If you have more than one y, not a function, okay, for that one value of x. So that's what it says. At most, one y value corresponds to any given x value. What that means is the graph of a function cannot have two or more different points with the same x coordinates. So if you go along here, pick any x value here, stop right here and look. If there's a y up here and a y down there, or over here, or anywhere, well that's one value there, not a function. It can only have one. It may not have any, but it can't have more than one. That's exactly what this says. And that means the graph cannot have more than one, two or more different points with the same x coordinate. No two points on the graph of a function can be vertically above or below each other. That's exactly what it means. When x has some value, I pointed to negative 3 here, there can't be more than one y to negative 3. So no two points can be lined up vertically over that negative 3 or any other value. Okay, uh, so therefore a vertical line, any vertical line you draw, cannot intersect the graph more than once. It may not intersect it at all, but it can't intersect it more than once. That gives us a graphical tool to determine something as function. That observation provides a convenient visual test called the vertical line test. Do you have a graph of a function? or graph, you don't know if it's a function or not, 
Just imagine any vertical line on that graph. Now, if it never intersects it, that's not a problem. But if it does intersect it, how many times can it intersect? One and only one. So no vertical line can intersect more than once. Okay, so here's the vertical line test. The set of points in a coordinate plane is the graph of y as a function of x, if and only if, okay, that implies it both ways, no vertical line intersects that graph more than once at more than one point. Okay? Oh, and I forgot to say after we did example one, there's a checkpoint. There's a checkpoint after every example in here. And if I suggest you do those checkpoints as soon as you can after class. As soon as you're not in another class, run, find a place you can isolate yourself. Uh, do the checkpoint if you uh, don't know if you got the right answer. I think the right answers for checkpoints are in the back uh, somewhere near the answers back there. But if you can't find out, figure out why you missed it, you can go to LarsonPreCalculus.com and get an audio video uh, description of that. Now we're going to example two, but they're skipping example two in the graph of the slideshow. So let's do it here. All right, there's a nice, beautiful looking curve there. Is that represent a function? Why is a function of that? This person right here. People at home can't see what I'm showing because it's not being projected. I'm holding it here. No, why not? This vertical line intersects it twice. How about this real curvy thing? Is that a function of x? Yes, because no vertical line intersects more than once. How about this one? Is that a function of x? Yes, it is. Even though that vertical line doesn't intersect, no sweat there, any other vertical, vertical line can only intersect once. Okay. So, they gave you in the book, the first is not a graph of y as a function of x, second is, the third one is. And guess what? There's a checkpoint. So please do the checkpoints. As soon as you can, out of class, while it's fresh on your mind. So let's move to the zeros of the function. Now we already hit this a little bit in section 1.4. We're going to hit it a little harder here, perhaps. And we're going to keep hitting it for most of this chapter, okay? Uh, so, get used to it. If the graph of a function, x, a function of x, has an x-intercept at a0, okay? Now what does that mean? That means for f of a is equal to 0, the function has a value of 0 when x is equal to a. Then we say that a is a 0, this is a point there. This is a zero of the function. So zeros of a function. Zeros of a function of f of x are the x values for which f of x equals zero. Didn't we do that in uh, section 1.4? You had some exercises for those, right? Find the x's for which that's true. You are finding the zeros of the function whether you knew it or not. Okay? Now, This one right here is not a function. Now, if we left off the bottom half of that, would that be a function? Yes, it would. Would that function, as written there, have any zeros? No, because it doesn't cross the x-axis. But if we left off the top half of that graph, would that be a function? Yes. Does that have any zeros? I don't know if you can tell, yes, right there, x equal 1. That's where it crosses the x-axis. Okay, this one that we said was a function, does that have any zeros? Yes, at least three. One there, one there, and one there. We don't know. This function may continue. If it comes back up again, it may have another. If it goes up and then comes back down again, it may have another. It could have umpteen zeros, okay? But it uh, does have at least three from what we see here. How about this one? Does that have any zeros? Not from what we see, and it looks like it keeps going straight that way and straight that way. So no, it doesn't look like there's a chance that one would have a zero. How about this one at the bottom in your checkpoint? Does that have a zero? 
Yeah, one and only at zero, zero it is here. Okay? So those are zeros of a function. We did it algebraically in the last chapter, in the last section, 1.4. Now we're going to do it graphically. Okay? And they mean the same. So, guess what? Don't do it algebraically again. Just a refresher, okay? Find the zeros of each of, of each function, okay? Now, what would it mean to be the zero of that function? Say again? I can't hear. Okay, a little louder. Okay, this one right here, what do we mean by the zeros of that function f? It's what? I can't hear the question, sorry. My question is, are we setting that the equation? Yes, that's what we do. The zeros of the function are where that function is equal to zero. So what we do with that one is, I'm going to erase what I just marked, and put um, 3x squared plus x minus 10. There's the function and set it equal to zero. You're trying to find the zeros of the function. Anyone want to make a guess of how many we might have? Anyone remember that from quadratic equations? Say again? You could have up to two. You may only have one, or you may have none. Okay? Let's see what we got. How would you investigate that? To find those zeros. Say again? Okay, I think I introduced this concept before. What's the F word? Factor. Okay, good. You got it right. Let's see if this will factor. It may not, okay? There's no guarantee it will. What's the only possible factorization for 3x squared? Say again. Okay, x times 3x. Is that what you said? Say yes. All right, yes, that's what you said, right? All right. Now, where do we look next? Sign of the last term, and that's a negative okay what does that tell you about these two signs they've got to be different so which way you want to put them plus minus or minus plus it's up to you huh minus plus let's try it minus plus we may be wrong okay now there's several different factorizations for 10 pick one say again did i hear one and 10 okay that's a possibility you want the one here and the 10 there Let's see what happens with that. Okay? We check it by formula. The first is x times 3x, 3x here. We knew that was going to be right. Okay? Then we do the outer, which is plus 10x minus 3x. That would be plus 7x. <coughs> wrong answer. Okay. And it's the wrong number. So therefore, I would suggest changing the numbers. Remember, we had several options here, so let's change the number. What's another possible factorization for 10? 5 and 2. You want them in that order? Okay, let's try it. 5 here and 2 there. Okay? Again, boil it to C. X times 3X is still 3X squared. We knew that was right. This would be plus 2X minus 15X worse. Okay, that would be minus 13x. <coughs> Wrong. Okay, but again, we can still, and we could have done this before, I forgot about it, we can change the numbers here. So let's say it that way. Let's flip those two numbers. Okay, we'll make the first one a 2 and the last one a 5. Is that what we did? Yeah. Yeah, now let's see what we've got x times 3x is 3x. Oh, yeah, it always has been, still is. Outer is plus 5x. Inner is minus 6x. What does that give you? Negative x. But at least the number's right. All that's wrong is the sign. So let's change the signs. Make this the plus. 
and make this one the minus. Now this is how I do it. It's a little weird, but it seems to work for me. So let's see if it does for you too. X times 3x is 3x squared. We did that. Minus 5x plus 6x, that's plus x, and 2 times minus 5 is negative 10. There we have it. Okay? Now that's called trial and error. We made three errors before we got a right, but we kept trying. Does anyone remember another way we could have done this? I don't know who you had for Math 100, but... Okay. The, the method I always called it, or read it in the books as the AC method. Anyone remember that? Okay. Uh, if you multiply A, which is 3, times C, which is negative 10, that gives you... AC is negative 30. Ooh, big number. Okay. A is 3, B is 1, C is negative 10, A times C is negative 30. What should B then? 1. Okay. So what you do now, you make up numbers to multiply to be negative 30, but add to be 1. Now, any numbers that multiply to add multiply to be negative 30 have to be opposite sign, a plus and a minus, right? But the add to be 1, that means the positive number has to be greater, right? Can you think of any two numbers that multiply to be 30, but whose difference is 1? 5 and 6. There, you had it, All right. And which one's positive, which is negative? Negative 5, positive 6, okay? Because they multiply to be negative 30, but add to be positive 1. Y'all are good. So what do we do with that? Now let's pretend, let's pretend that we didn't do it this way. Uh, so I'm going to erase these. But y'all got it written down, right? Good. Okay, please say yes. Okay. Now, what we do with that B is split that into, see the A stays the same, 3x squared. But then, rather than plus x, we say minus 5x plus 6x. Isn't that plus x? Okay. And then minus 10. That stays the same and set that equal to 0. All right. Now, what do we do now? If you have four terms, what's another method for factoring? Grouping. Okay. So let's group the first two, and let's group the last two. What's the only possible factorization of 3x squared minus 5x? What's the only thing they have in common? x. So let's factor out x, and what do we have left? Say again. 3x minus 5. Okay, let's do the same here. Plus, is there any common factor between 6x and minus 10? What? plus 2. What do you have left? So you factor a 2 out of 6x, you have 3x, and you factor a 2 out of minus 10, you get a minus 5, right? That's equal to 0. Now we look at this and say, are there any common factors between these two big terms? Yes, the 3x minus 5 is the same. Factor it out. And what do we have? 3x minus 5, and what do we have left? x plus 2. Isn't that what we had before? Y'all have it written down, right? I hope we got it right, did we? Good, all right. So this is your, this is the AC method. So you can either do trial and error or AC. And what's another thing you could always fall back on if you didn't want to go through all that? Quadratic formula, exactly. Do I need to show you that now? Are you okay? Yeah, let's do that. Huh? Let's do, that. do that one too. Okay. Now it starts like the AC method did. A is equal to what? 3. B is equal to 1. And C is equal to negative 10. Keep the signs with it. Now the quadratic formula does this. It writes down the answer for you x is equal to 
Anyone remember how it goes? Minus B. No, plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 AC all divided by 2 2A. 2A. Okay. Get to know that. That will be your friend many times. That's the quadratic formula. You just write down the answer now. Of course, you have to do some simplifying, but write it down. What was your B? 1. So this will be a minus 1 plus or minus the square root of what? Say again. 1. 1. 1 squared is 1 minus 4 times what's your A? 3. What's your C? Negative 10. Okay. All this is divided by 2 times 3. Okay? Now, we didn't quite finish doing the problem before. So let's go on and do this problem before. Sorry, I, I should have done this before we got started on quadratic formula. If you have two entities that multiply to be 0, and you notice we got these either by trial and error or AC method, right? Okay, what do we do with those then? If you have two entities multiplying to be zero, what does that tell you? One or the other of them has to be zero. There is no number in the world you can multiply together with some other number to get zero as an answer unless one of those numbers is zero, right? Okay, so we set that. Either 3x minus 5 is equal to zero or x plus 2 is equal to zero. No doubt about it. One of those has to be zero. Okay? Let's solve this one. Now, that's a linear equation. That's pretty easy to solve. What do we do with that? Add five to both sides. And that gives us 3x equal five. And then do what? Divide both sides by three. And that gives us x equal Five-thirds, one of my favorite numbers in the world, right? Okay. Now, on the other one, what, does that, what do we do there? Subtract 2 from both sides, and what does that give us? X equal negative 2. That one's a lot shorter, wasn't it? Okay, those are our two zeros for that function. Okay? Now, and I've already forgotten your name. You told me you expect to have two zeros, and we got them. Don't look for any more. There can't be any more than two because that was a quadratic. The maximum exponent is two. Can't find any more zeros than two. So let's proceed with our quadratic formula now. Sorry, I uh, disrupted it. Okay, this is going to be minus one plus or minus the square root of one. Now here's what I do next. Now this is mine. You can do it any way you want. What I do next is count the number of negatives. That negative 4 is always going to be a minus. But the, you have one more, so how many negatives you got? Two. Anytime you have an even number of negatives, what does that become? Positive. If you have an odd number of negatives, like negative plus plus, that's going to be minus. Or negative, 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 that would be minus. Anytime you have an odd number of minuses, it's going to be negative. Even number of minuses, it's going to be plus. Thank you. It's going to be plus. Okay? So I put the sign in there. And then what does that give us? Oh, my goodness. 4 times 3 is? 120. Is that what I heard? All right. And that's divided by 2 times 3 is? 6. Okay? That's going to be a negative 1 plus or minus. The square root of 1 plus 120 is? 121 divided by 6. Now, that's a minus 1, plus or minus. Does anyone know what the square root of 121 is? Yeah, your calculator does, doesn't it? 11, okay, divided by 6. Okay, let's do it one at a time. Minus 1 plus 11 would be 10 over 6 which reduces to 
5 over 3. Ding, ding, ding. There we have that, don't we? Okay. Or minus 1 minus 11 is negative 12 over 6 is negative 2. Ding, 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 ding. There we have the other one. Okay. So we got the same answer whether we did trial and error, AC method, uh, quadratic formula. Any way you want to do it. Whichever one you like best. You get to choose. Uh, go with it. All right. That was the A one. We found the two zeros three different ways of that first function. Can I erase? Or someone still writing? Okay, let me know when you're through. Quick review of Math 100, huh? Helpful or not? Waste of time? Okay. Did I hear her say, big waste of time? No, okay. No. All right. Everybody got it? All right. All right, to erase? Let's go to the B one. G of x is equal to square root of 10 minus x squared. Okay? Now this one might be a little tougher to guess how many zeros you might have. We don't know, but let's see. Okay? Now, how in the world would you do something like that? What would make that g equal 0? In other words, what we're looking for is the square root of 10 minus x squared is equal to 0. What might be your first step to determine what that value of x would be? Okay. It's going to be a little tough to factor, especially at this point. What do you need to get rid of first? Okay, the radical sign, is that what you want to get rid of? How do you get rid of it? Squaring both sides, okay? Warning, warning, anytime you square both sides of an equation, you're going to have to check your answers. I forgot to check the answers back here on the other one, but we felt really good about it, didn't we? But we could have checked them. This one, you've got to check. So what happens if you square both sides? 10 minus x squared equals 0. Well, that makes sense anyway, doesn't it? The only way a radical is going to be 0 is if what's inside the radical is 0, okay? Only way you can do it. So another way to get there. Now what might we do? We want to solve for x. So how do we do this? One way is add x squared to both sides. Now, most of the time you don't do this with a quadratic, but this one is a pretty safe bet to do, right? Okay, now that wipes out this, and what does that, I'm going to flip sides on it. x squared is equal to 10. Now, how do you undo a square? Take a square root. So this would be x is equal to, now when you take a square root of both sides, what do you have to include? plus minus, plus or minus the square root of 10. Okay, there are your two possible solutions. Now what we have to do here is plug them in because you squared both sides. Make sure you haven't introduced what they call an extraneous solution. Okay, so let's do it. G of my, uh, plus, we'll do the plus first, the square root of 10 would be the square root of 10 minus the square root of 10 squared. Okay? Lots of roots there and 10s there, aren't there? Okay? So this is the square root of 10 minus, and what square root of 10 squared? 10. And 10 minus 10 is 0, so surely that's equal to 0. Let's do the other one g of minus the square root of 10. And that would be the square root of 10 minus negative square root of 10 squared. Okay? And that would be the square root of 
10 minus, and what is negative? Root 10 squared. Negative times negative is positive, and root, square root, root 10 times root 10 is the root that leaves up, no, no, that's root 11, okay. 10. So that does give you the same answer, 10 minus 10 equals 0. Yes, both of those are solutions. But you've got to check, got to check any time you square both sides of an equation. Don't fail to do that. All right. Do we have room to do C? Okay. What would be your first step on that one? In fact, it sets up so nicely just to set this equal to zero. We're finding the zeros, so set that function equal to zero. Now, there's a couple of things you might want to do first. One of them's a really good idea, always. Okay. If for y'all still writing this one, I'll try not to get in the way of y'all. Get over here. Over here. Okay. No, probably not. Very many people sway. Maybe even somebody. Okay. Now, one thing I like to do, it's just my preference, is when I see this, immediately my eyes go to this. Because there you have your variable in the denominator. What do we have to watch out for? You can never divide by zero. So that says that t plus 5 cannot equal zero. Now this has nothing to do with the problem we're doing, except I'm just noting this. t plus 5 cannot equal zero. And how do I solve that inequality? How do I solve it? Solve for t. Say again. Subtract 5 from both sides. And that gives me t cannot equal negative 5. Now, it has nothing to do with finding the zeros. Just any time I see one like that, I want to do that. Okay? Now, actually, I should have done the same thing with g. Only there, that thing in parentheses can't be negative. And if we did that, we'd find out it can't be uh, less than negative root, root 10, nor it can be greater than positive root 10. So that would take a lot of time, so I forgot to do that, old shucks. Okay, this didn't take much time at all. T can't be negative 5, okay? Now, here's what really matters on this problem, which we're finding the zero. If this is your equation here, what can make that expression equal to zero. The only thing that can. Say again? Negative five. Okay, no, no. Negative five makes the denominator, but we're not worried about that. We want the entire expression equal zero. What will make that expression equal to zero? Okay. Actually, only if the numerator is zero. If the denominator is zero, it's not defined, okay? But if that numerator is zero, it doesn't matter what the denominator is, that's going to be zero, isn't it? Zero over 4,585,816.3 is still zero, okay? If that numerator is zero, the whole thing's going to be zero. So all we have to do is set the numerator equal to zero. And what does that give us? What we do to solve for t. Add 3 to both sides. Okay, that wipes out that 3, and that gives us 2t equal 3. Divide by 2, and that gives us t is equal to 3 halves. The one and only one zero for that function is that. Now, why do we do the other? To make sure it's not equal to negative 5. And 3 halves is not negative 5, so there's the 0. Most of the time it won't be. <laughs> if it were, you probably could have factored it out anyway. Okay? So there's your only answer here. The first one had two answers. This one has two answers. This one only has one. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, the book is going to do it a slightly different way, which is quite legal. Okay? 
Uh, but I like the way I did it. But let's see. I'm going to probably have to race. Okay, to race, anyone still writing? Yay or nay? Okay, so let me go on an erase. So let's see how they did the A one. To find the zeros of a function, set the function equal to zero. That's what we mean. Solve for the independent variable, so set that equal to zero, and solve. Now, how did they go about doing it? They factored, okay? They acted like they didn't have to do a trial and error, but I bet you they did. They just showed the answer. And this gave me x equal what? Anyone remember? Five thirds. This gave us x equal. Second, negative two, right? Okay. And the up there, you get x equal five thirds, and here you get x equal negative two. Okay. Each of those equal to zero because of the zero product principle. Only way you have the product of two entities being zero, one or the other has to be zero. So those are the two possibilities. Now, we didn't go back and check. We might should have, but we didn't do anything to lead us. Thing. This will be sort of a pain in the neck, but it's still doable. 5 thirds squared is, anyone remember? Square 5, you get 15. Square it, not double it. Say again? 25. And you square 9 and you get? I mean, square 3 kids, it is. Square three and you get? Nine. nine. Okay. So 25 ninths would be right here, but this three will go into nine three times, so that would be 25 thirds. Plus five thirds, so that would be 30 thirds. 30 thirds is? 30 divided by three is? 10 minus 10 is? Zero. Yeah, that wasn't too bad, was it? Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, I get a negative 2. Negative 2 squared is? Positive 4 times 3 is? Positive 12. Minus 2. 12 minus 2. 10 minus 10 is? 0. That works. Okay. So we won't do that with all of them. I think we already did with the others. Okay. And here is the graph of that. This is the graphing section. Here is what it looks like. Anyone know what this shape is called? Parabola. Parabola, excellent. And if the parabola crosses the x-axis, it usually will do it twice. That's where you got that. There are occasions if this parabola were translated upward to just that point right down here, the only thing that's touched, then you could only have one solution. Okay? But if you translate it a little bit further so it never crossed, you have no solution. So you can't guarantee this will give you two solutions. That's the most it can give you. But it may only be one. It's quite likely it's going to be two. Could be only one or could be none. Okay. Anyway, this one has two. One here, one there. The X intercepts. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. This one. You set the g of x equals 0, we did, and then square both sides, okay? When you do that, you need to make a little mental note or a flashing light or something saying be sure you check your answers, okay? So what we're going to do here is add uh, x squared to both sides like we did, and then here we'll take square roots. But when you take the square root, you have to put plus or minus, okay? Now. They need to check this. I bet you they don't. What they'll do is just show that. Okay? They say these are the ones, and here is what that represents. Now, square root of 10, tell me approximately the value of that. Between what two integers is the square root of 10? Between, okay, pick a perfect square less than 10. 9. And what's it the perfect square of? Three. So if something greater than three, but less than, pick a perfect square greater than ten. Sixteen, that's the square of? 
4. So it's between 3 and 4. So that's why they put it over here, closer to 3 than it is to 4. They didn't do a very good job here. Uh, they should have expanded the scale, made it a little bit bigger. But it's something between plus 3 and plus 4, closer to plus 3, or between minus 3 and minus 4, closer to minus 3. Okay? Now, does anyone know what shape that is? Anyone? Make a guess. Half of a circle? That's exactly what it is. I'm going to show you why that's true. Let's go back to the first thing right here. What is g of x? Same if I had said f of x. Y. So this would be y is equal to the square root of 10 minus x squared. Right? Now, if I were to square both sides of that, I would get y squared is equal to 10 minus x squared. Right? Now, if we add x squared to both sides, you get x squared plus y squared is equal to 10. Does anyone know what that is? That's a circle of radius square root of 10. Okay? And if we that had been our problem, here would have been... what it looked like. Now, this is a really ugly circle, but just pretend that's a circle. All right. Now, why didn't they give us that as a problem? Why did they give us a circle? What is this not? Say again? It's not a function. Why is it not a function? Yes, vertical line test fails in all but two places and then anything beyond those. This is a function. This is a function because it only has one value to it. This one is not a function because there's two y values. Okay. All right. So, so therefore, the original thing was a semicircle, half of a circle. All right. That's way too much. Okay. Not necessary. Okay. Those are the intercepts. Okay. Look at the C part. Now, here's where they deviate from what I did. What I did is say, only thing that's going to make that zero is if the numerator is zero. So I just did with that. It was so easy to do. And this is easy too. What they say to do is multiply both sides by t plus 5. Because if you multiply this side by t plus 5 and multiply this side by t plus 5, these t plus 5s divide out as 1. And zero times anything is zero, so that gives you just that. You get to the same point. I just don't like multiplying both sides by t plus 5, because guess what? If t plus 5 had been zero, then you wipe out all meaning of your problem. So that's why we didn't want t plus 5 to be zero, so t couldn't equal negative 5. But it gives you the same result, and then you add 3 to both sides, divide by 2, and you get t equal 3 halves. The one and only solution there. Okay? Here is the graph of this, and they didn't show you how to graph it. They just said this is the graph, and there is the one and only x intercept. It's the only solution. Okay. Now, that's not the whole graph of this function, but we're going to leave that alone for now. Notice here... It starts bending down and never comes up again. Why? Because t can never equal negative 5. So it gets closer and closer and closer to negative 5. It never changes. Okay? And then you have something on this side that did the same thing over here. But it wouldn't cost the x axis. All right. Sorry, I probably talked way too much there. I take it by the movement that we must be getting short of time. Are we already out? What we got? Two minutes. That just may be time enough. Oh, there is a checkpoint bottom of page 51. We will start next time with increasing and decreasing functions, top of page 52. Okay? Let me put that mark in place. And let's see. Oh, yes, we can find some homework exercises here.
You can do either seven or nine. They're both at Calc Chat. Nine's at Calc View. You can do 11 or 13. They're both at Calc Chat. 11's at Calc View. You can find do any of the odds, 15 to 25. They're all at Calc Chat. 25's at Calc View. Uh, think you can do any of the odds, 27 to 31. They're all at Calc Chat. And we'll stop and pick up the rest of those next time. Okay? Any questions? Am I cheating you out of any of your tuition dollars? What time is it? Second? What time is it? 9.45. Oh, okay. Right on the nose then. That was a good answer, whether it's true or not. Uh, okay, never mind. All right. All right. We'll pick up and go from there next time. See, 1.5 is a much shorter section. Hopefully we'll finish it and get into 1.6. What comes after 1.6? 1. 1.6. A quiz. A quiz. And then 1.7. So you're happy. All right. Good deal. And we'll see you Thursday. Yes, sir. Where's the student What's that? We don't really have much of one. What do you need? Cafeteria? UAB. Okay, on the Brassford campus. Okay, my guess is the front desk up there, where the uh, you know where you come in from the back parking lot. I, I think that's what. Yeah. Uh, now, if it's not there, we'll find it. So let me let me get this doing, and I'll help you.